Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our free Facebook Live event, Can Plant-Based Diet Stop Cancer in Dogs? Featuring Dr. Claire Nottenfeld. My name is Jeff Bloom, Education Marketing Director here at Wild Earth. Dr. Nottenfeld will discuss what factors are thought to increase the risk of cancer in our pets, and she will review the evidence that could suggest plant-based diets might lower the incidence of cancer in dogs. Wild Earth utilizes the powers of plants and science to create a healthy, high protein, nutritionally complete and balanced food for dogs without harming animals or the environment. Tens of thousands of Wild Earth customers have reported health benefits by switching their dogs to Wild Earth. We are proud to introduce Dr. Claire Nottenbelt. Claire is a graduate of Bristol University and then completed her residency at the University of Edinburgh with a specialty in small animal medicine. She was clinical director of the University of Glasgow's Small Animal Hospital for six years and worked within the university's oncology service for 11 years. Through her work with Hawk and Dove, Claire provides support to help general practitioners deliver accessible cancer care to their patients. Throughout her illustrious career with more than 20 years of experience, she has worked to provide accessible cancer care to pets around the world and continues to spread her love of animals, providing support to horses with cancer, as well as developing novel treatments for cancer and dogs. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Claire Nottenfeld. Thanks, Jeff. That was a very generous uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. And welcome, everybody. And I'm really delighted to um, be talking to you tonight about my views on whether plant-based feeding can stop cancer in dogs. I think this is a really exciting um, area to get involved in these days. And it's it's something that's becoming um, an area that people are getting much more interested in, um, looking at plant-based feeding. And so tonight, I'll, I'll share with you some of my experiences and my thoughts um, relating to this. So first up, it's important to understand that cancer comes in many forms. I think when we talk about cancer, we often think about um, cancer that has inevitably spread, um, particularly in humans. We talk about battling cancer, um, but it's really important to understand that, that cancer comes in a range of forms. And what we can see on these pictures here is different forms of cancer in the dog. So we've got the first one, um, the sort of miniature schnauzer up there on the top, the left hand side, that's a really nasty looking mast cell tumour. The next one along is a, a large sarcoma, but you can see the hair and the skin are all in, very intact in that. The next one along is actually also a mast cell tumour, but you can see a lot smaller. And then the next one where you can just see that abnormal lip, that's actually a dog with skin, a skin form of lymphoma. Then on the bottom row, we have a dog with an anal sac tumor. They're really, really common in older dogs. And if you do have a, a dog over the um, age of eight, you really should be getting the vet to check their anal glands routinely um, every year when they have their annual health checks and vaccinations. The next one along in the mouth, this is a nasty melanoma. And melanomas particularly can be very likely to spread. So that's a tumor that tends to go into lots of different places. Then we have a picture of the bladder and um, this is a scan, this picture, an ultrasound scan of the bladder here. And um, what we can see is there's a sort of the black areas are where the urine is and that should be a big round balloon. And you can see this tissue sitting within the bladder. And that's a dog with a, a bladder tumour that's called a transitional cell carcinoma. And then the last picture across on the bottom right hand side here is a bone tumour. And that's a dog with osteosarcoma. So some of these tumours can be very likely to spread all the way through the body. Some can be very localised. And just looking at the patient doesn't always tell you, you know, even if one looks relatively benign, like that little tiny mast cell tumour, they can actually spread quite widely. So it's really a range of things going on. And any lump or bump is strictly a form of cancer. And, you know, it's important to understand that because I think sometimes as a, an owner, you hear the word cancer and you, you worry, you, obviously, because you associate cancer with inevitable death, which isn't always the case. But the key is to identify these things early and deal with them promptly, because in some situations, chopping it out may actually be curative. And that's going to be the best treatment for some of these things where we have a more widespread disease. Then we have to look at alternatives. 
But cancer is is pretty much ubiquitous. It's all over the place. And within dogs, around one in three dogs will develop cancer during their lives. And almost 50% of them will die of cancer, particularly once they reach the age of over 10 years old. So we see a lot more cancer in older patients. And that actually kind of equates to around about just under 10% of dogs being diagnosed with cancer every year. And that's quite a scary thought because I'm sure all of you know more than 10 dogs, you know, in your communities, friends who've got dogs and so forth. So it's quite a high proportion when we think of it like that. But it's not a surprising statistic because in humans, we know one in two will go on to develop cancer and that affects all of us. It tends to be around 45 percent of women and around 50 percent of men will develop cancer during their lifetimes. And worldwide, one in six people die of cancer. So cancer is the leading cause of death in humans. And that is despite the fact that we have worked very hard to have a whole range of treatment options for humans and that the things that we're prepared to put ourselves through as a human is very different to what we're prepared to put our pets through. So when we're treating pets with cancer, we have to take into consideration the fact that they can't say, yes, I accept these side effects for that degree of prolongation. So whilst it's sad to think that every little puppy born, and there's a, a picture here of a, a boxer with her, her wee pup, litter of pups, a proportion of those, and particularly, unfortunately, boxers, um, are quite prone to cancer. So are golden retrievers in the lower picture. So there's quite a lot of, of cancer out there um, in our patients. So what causes cancer? And, you know, obviously we know in humans and in animals, there's a range of different reasons why um, we get cancer. Cancer in itself is, if you like, it's an abnormal mutation within a cell and that cell then gets carried away and grows and changes. So what we're really looking at is what causes these abnormal mutations in the first place. Now, in our bodies at any time and in our animals' bodies, there are mutations taking place. And some of those mutations could be beneficial. And that's, if you like, what drives changes um, within species and, and so forth. It, it uh, drives evolution, really. So it's a good thing. Having some mutations and some changes is a good thing. But what we see in cancer is that these changes and these mutations kind of switch on a cell to enable it to almost be immortal. And, and then we're not getting them kind of killed off by the immune system appropriately. And at that point, we start to see cancers developing. But it's really what drives that mutation. We know in dogs that there is a genetic predisposition. I've got a picture of a German shepherd here because German shepherds are highly predisposed to develop hemangiosarcoma, which is a tumour of the spleen and the heart and really stems from blood vessel growth and abnormal blood vessels becoming cancerous. So we know that there are certain breeds that are prone to certain tumours. And it's quite interesting when you think about that, because obviously in dogs, the, the genetic diversity is quite narrow. You know, you can have a little Chihuahua and a Great Dane. And actually, in terms of their genes, there's not that much difference between them. They're actually quite well gene preserved. But despite that, and that's probably down to our fab fabulous efforts at breeding specific breeds, we've managed to breed specific predispositions as well, which is the downside of the range of, of dogs that we have created through our breeding programs. We also have environmental factors, and I'll go, I'm going to go through a little bit more detail on the, each of these. Obesity and being overweight and inflammation. And it's really important to also understand that at, with age, there is an increased risk of cancer. That's the same in humans. So, you know, the longer you live, the more likely you are to die of cancer or to get cancer. So, for example, the 91-year-old the man on the street may well have prostatic cancer, and it may be that they've made a decision not to treat it because he's going to die of other things before um, the prostatic cancer becomes a problem. And it's the same in our pets. So we have the older patients. You know, I tend to see patients maybe over the age of eight or nine. It does vary. The youngest um, dog with cancer I've ever seen was only six months old. That was an absolute tragedy. So it does range. Um, you know, it's not guaranteed that if your pet is six months old, it does not have cancer. But as soon as your pet kind of hits the, the older pet time, so maybe seven, maybe eight, maybe a bit younger in some of the larger breeds, the risk of cancer significantly increases. 
And why is that? Well, it's partly down to the exposure to all these different factors that I'm going to go on and talk about now. So as I touched on before, in German shepherds, we get the, the tumor hemangiosarcoma, which is a nasty one in the spleen and, and can be very aggressive and very difficult to manage. So if your dog gets this tumor, then even surgically removing the spleen will only buy you around six to 12 weeks of time. So we often use chemotherapy to manage these. Boxers are very prone to mast cell tumours. Scottish Terriers, um, which is in this little picture here, for those of you who don't know Scottish Terriers, I'm sure there are uh, definitely some in America. Um, there's not actually very many in Scotland, bizarrely. They are very prone to bladder cancer. Uh, the flat coat retrievers are prone to histiocytic disease, particularly histiocytic sarcoma. And the Bernese mountain dog is also prone to histiocytic sarcoma and histiocytic bone marrow disease. This is just a selection of some of the kind of the, the more significant breeds, I suppose, um, because actually, if you gave me the breed of a dog, I could probably, for most of them, come up with the most common tumour that they're going to present with. So there's nothing we can do about this except pick a dog that hasn't got a genetic predisposition. And that's easier said than done. You know, I always think to myself when people say, what kind of dog should I get so that I don't get a dog with cancer next time? I kind of go through all the breeds and I'm like, not that one, not that one, not that one, not that one, not that one. And then I come to the conclusion, maybe the best option would be to get a mongrel, but I got a mongrel and he got cancer. So I don't know. The reality is there's a lot of cancer out there. So it's pretty difficult to, to avoid it, the, the genetic predisposition. What we can do as responsible owners and breeders is look to see if there's any way in the future we could move towards breeding some of these out. And certainly in the flat coat retrievers, it's quite interesting because there's a Norwegian line of flat coats that does not have histiocytic sarcoma. Whereas in the UK, the UK lines of flat coats have a lot of histiocytic sarcoma. So clearly, there's that genetic predisposition. And there's a lot of research going on trying to look at what the genetics are, because that will also help inform human genetic studies in the future. So the next big thing is environmental factors. And, you know, we know that that living increases the risk of cancer. So being out there, um, you know, sunbathing in humans is going to increase your risk of, of skin cancer. Um, tobacco smoke exposure is going to increase your risk of lung cancer, for example. And we know that this also occurs in pets. So exposure to tobacco smoke, um, obviously they don't smoke, so they're not doing direct um, contact, but they will be taking passive smoke in from their environment if they live in a smoking environment. And also there is a, a risk of what we call third hand smoke. So we have the first hand smoke, which is the one that you choose to smoke in yourself. You have the second hand smoke, which is the person next to you is smoking and you're inhaling that. So that's what most pets are going to be getting if they live with a smoker. And then you also have third hand smoke, which is the smoke particles that have fallen down onto surfaces in the home and then become oxidized and are even more carcinogenic. So we know that tobacco smoke can increase the risk of, of nasal tumors. The picture in the middle um, is a CT scan of a dog's nose. So it's like a cross section through the nose. And you can see one side has lots of nice black with the swirly bits. That's a normal inside of nose. And the other side is just kind of whited out. And that's a nose tumor. OK, so nose tumors seem to be um, predisposed to by exposure to tobacco smoke in dogs. We also see some changes in the lungs, um, increased coughing and so forth. But we haven't kind of directly linked it to things like lung cancer yet. We can also see um, pollutants causing damage. So exposure to herbicides and other toxins in the environment. And obviously, this is something that we're perhaps all becoming a little bit more aware of in terms of environmental pollutants in, in human health. Things like, you know, ex exposure to car exhaust fumes, um, toxins on foods and so forth. You know, if, if things have been sprayed with chemicals. We also know um, that UV light and radiation, like radiation from the sun, um, can increase the risk of cancer. 
that tends to be less of an issue in dogs than it does in cats, but it can occur particularly if you've got very pale skinned animals so um, and thin haired. And it tends, we tend to see it in the ear tips of cats where we get changes, but we can potentially see that in dogs as well. So we quite often see um, nose tumours and things like that lying across the, the, the sort of less hairy parts of the nose. So there may be a component of UV light and radiation there as well in terms of predisposing. OK, and what we can see in this picture down here, just to show you, this is a, a dog that has um, spread of its cancer. So this is an X-ray here. We've got the, the back of the dog here, the spine, and then we've got the sternum down the base of the chest. And this is the, the airway, the trachea here and the heart. And we can see lungs, normal lungs here. And we've got these blobs. OK, so that is a sign of a, a dog that's got spread um, to its chest. And um, those of you who are sharp eyed will notice these metal things here. And actually, this was a dog that had had surgery to have a tumour at the front of its chest removed. And this was an x-ray taken after it had been on chemotherapy for some time. Um, so uh, that's just to kind of show you the sort of things you might expect to see. So what about obesity? Well, in humans, the link between obesity and cancer is quite well proven. So being overweight or having obesity is the second biggest cause of cancer in the UK. And, you know, we all understand that that obesity um, contributes to a lot of health issues. But I think people don't always remember how important it is in relation to cancer as well. So more than one in 20 cancer cases in humans are actually caused by being overweight. And the unfortunate thing is the risk is higher the more weight you gain and the longer you're overweight for. So it's never too late to stop you know, and try and reverse that, um, those obesity issues. And it's important to think, well, why does this happen? How does this happen? How does the obesity contribute to the cancer development? And it's because growth hormones increase with body fat and growth hormones are hormones that stimulate growth. So if you've got abnormal cells that are mutated and trying to be immortal, and then you buzz them up with growth hormones, that's not going to be a good thing. OK, so it's going to increase the growth factors and the ability of these cells to continue to grow and divide. The other thing that can happen is you get inflammation as the body is trying to remove the dead fat from your body. So recycle some of that fat. Um, it creates inflammation. And this is probably the reason why being overweight increases the risk of diabetes and so forth as well. And there's also a theory that when you're larger, you have more cells. And so the risk of mutation in any given situation is going to increase. So if I've got sort of 10 cakes in front of me, and there's a one in 10 chance of a cake mutating, okay, into a, a donut, then that's a one in 10 chance, but that's that's one donut. And that's one donut that could go on and do something. If we have 100 cakes in front of me and there's a 10% chance that's going to be 10 donuts. So now I've got 10 donuts that the immune system has to remove. So more cells mean more cells with mutations, which means more challenge for the immune system to remove them and more risk that they bypass the immune system. And the other thing to consider in this situation of obesity is that just the direct link with nutrition. So in humans, dietary factors account for around 30% of human cancer cases in the US. And that is a pretty significant proportion. You know, there's, we already said that one in two people are going to get cancer. And now we're saying 30% of them relate to dietary factors. And it's well known that vegetarian diets do confer protection against cancer. And it was interesting, whilst I was preparing this talk, um, this pinged up on, on my BBC News app um, to show that in France, they have confirmed the link between processed meats. So that's your sausages, salamis, um, your pepperamis, all these kind of things, chorizo, all of those kind of things. Uh, anything that has gone through a kind of processing system has an increased risk, increases the risk of cancer. And it's because often the many of these products are using nitrates as kind of preservatives um, to, to 
change and adapt the meat to make it taste different. So what we know is that meat in itself is a known carcinogen to humans and processed meat is grade one. Now, grade one is the worst one. So that's the most severe carcinogen. Where And red meat, so that is your lamb and your beef, is a grade two carcinogen. So we know that eating those kind of products for humans increases the risk of cancer development and equally cutting them out reduces the risk of cancer development. So what about the link in dogs? Well, we know that between 20 and 60 percent of dogs are overweight. Um, so we know there's a big obesity problem. We know it contributes to arthritis. Um, it contributes to diabetes in some of these patients. And we need to remember that dogs actually are very, very similar to us. They share the same hormones. They have the same kind of metabolism as humans. The challenge we've got in the veterinary world is the way we look at things. So when we, in the human world, it's much easier to do what they call prospective studies, which means you take a group of people and you say, right, we're going to put you on this diet for this number of weeks, and then we're going to see what happens to health parameters. What we've tended to do with dogs and cats for that matter, is we tend to look back. So we get to the end of dogs' lives and we then ask people, well, what did you feed your dog? Um, you know, was your dog overweight? And then we try and link that with the condition that we're trying to investigate. And that's good in that it tells us a lot of data and, you know, allows us to get access to a lot of data, but it tells us old data. It doesn't tell us moving forward data. And that's quite difficult, therefore, um, to know exactly what is going on. How many dogs that got cancer 10 years ago were obese? How many dogs that are getting cancer now are obese? Okay. So it, it's a it's not as well tuned and not as well kind of identified in the dog. But we do know that dogs get very similar colonic tumors to those that humans get. The only difference might be is we don't see quite as many of them. And I was I was actually chatting to my fellow oncologist just the other day, and we were talking about this issue about why do dogs not get as many colonic tumors? And of course, part of that, maybe we don't routinely screen dogs. So maybe they do, and we just don't routinely screen them. Or is it because they don't live long enough because they have a shorter lifespan than us? They don't have as long to get the colonic tumors. We didn't really come to a conclusion, but you know, I always think it's really good to talk through some of these ideas and, and have that in the back of your mind and just be thinking, could it be this? Could it be this? And keeping an open mind about why that might not be the case. Having said that, they do get nasty colonic tumours when they occur. And dogs get a lot of tumours. So it's, you know, it, it makes it harder because of the genetic predispositions and so forth to necessarily say, oh, well, they have a lower incidence because maybe they just got another tumour and therefore didn't make it to get the colonic tumour towards the end of their lives. Who knows? And that leads me nicely into the idea of inflammation as a cause or an association with cancer. Um, and this picture, pardon for the, if you're, you know, um, eating your lunch or your breakfast or your tea, depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, but this is a picture up a dog's bottom using um, a colonoscope. So we've passed an endoscope up and we've inflated the, the colon. And I think it's pretty clear to see this is kind of normal looking colon. And then this is this really gnarly, yucky bit. And this is a dog with a, a colonic or rectal tumor. Um, and we know that you can get little polyps. And this is a sort of more polypoid mass. Well, this is a polypoid mass. We can get rectal polyps that are essentially benign growths, but over time, they then convert to cancerous growth. So that is a well-known association in the dog. OK, so and we know that in humans as well, you know, there's a lot of um, polypoid colonic disease. And if you've had that in your family, you'll probably be getting routine monitoring as a human, you know, regular colonoscopies. And this is the sort of view that the doctors will be getting um, and that you'll be getting regular kind of checkups to look for any polyps because they'll want to make sure that you haven't got new polyps forming because of that risk that it can progress. The same occurs with bladder polyps. So um, bladder tumours can start from a point of just being a benign polyp. 
Okay, so it's a benign growth. It's it's growing excessively, but it's not a kind of growth that's going to invade and become very aggressive. And when we think of benign polyps, we tend to think if you chop them out, it's going to be curative. Whereas if we've got the more malignant disease, it's much more likely to infiltrate through into other tissues. Inflammatory bowel disease um, can also be associated with progressing to things like bowel lymphoma or bowel carcinoma, both of which are nasty cancers. So the presence of kind of ongoing diarrhea and things like that can predispose to, to cancer in that respect. Anal sac disease, I, I really couldn't tell you the number of patients that I see with an anal sac tumour where you look back in the history and they've had chronic problems with their anal sac. So you might call them anal glands. That's a common term that, that owners use. They're strictly anatomically anal sacs, not glands. Um, and they're the scent glands at the bottom of the dog. And if they have been chronically irritated and chronically inflamed, there is an increased risk of cancer. And one tumour that's particularly close to my heart is um, thyroid disease. The dog um, on the left here, this one, um, this is my boy Huntley, who I lost to cancer 11 years ago now. Um, and he had a thyroid problem. He had low thyroid levels um, and that was fine. And then we treated that. But over time, he developed a little lump in that area. And unfortunately, this is an example of me being a very bad owner um, and not really paying a lot of attention to him. Um, he developed a small lump. And I thought to myself, well, that's just inflammation because he's got inflammation of his thyroid gland. We know that's the mechanism by which his thyroid disease probably has occurred. And the next thing I knew was it was a big solid mass and a really aggressive tumour. And so it's something that I, as an owner, learned. And it's it's one of the things I suppose have changed my perception as an oncologist is living life as an owner. Um, it's very difficult being on the other side of the fence. It's much easier being the oncologist who supports the owner than it is being the owner. And that's something that I've learned from dealing with Huntley. Um, and the process we went through. The other dog in this picture is my current dog, Jumble. Um, he, this is him looking a lot more youthful. He's a little bit larger than that now, but we are trying to watch his weight by feeding him a plant-based diet. Um, and he developed a mast cell tumour on his head. And that was I know categorically at the site of a tick bite. Now, does that mean I think that all tick bites are going to change into mast cell tumours? No, but there was definitely that association between an inflammatory focus that the, the lump just didn't go away. You know, I took the tick out myself, the lump just didn't go away. And I thought I need to stick a needle in it. I stuck a needle in it. And then it swelled to the size of a golf ball um, because it contained mast cell tumour. And so it the mast cells started reacting and producing histamine and, and things. So he's had it chopped off and, and so far so good. He's been absolutely fine. And that's just an example, though, of how cancer can start from an inflammatory focus. So it's really important as owners that we're aware of inflammation and we keep on top of it. OK, and that's particularly true with if you've got a very itchy dog um, and you've got poor skin health. I think it is really important to get that skin health as good as it can be um, all the way through the dog's life to try and prevent ongoing problems in the future. So that's a big, bit of a background on how cancer works and why cancers might occur in, in dogs to such a high frequency and in humans, and that kind of looking at the comparators between humans and dogs. So we need to ask the key question, which is could plant-based feeding help reduce this problem? So we're going to take the same kind of categories that, that I've talked about already and look at whether plant-based feeding could actually help these categories. And clearly, genetic predisposition is never going to be helped by plant-based feeding. We're not going to change an animal's genetics by whatever we put into it at the front end. The only way we can really deal with genetic predispositions is to address it from a breeding perspective. And that is going to be very difficult. You know, it's going to be nigh on impossible to eliminate all cancers because even if we eliminated all the genetic predisposition, we're still left with the other factors that we need to take into account.
And I didn't mention this picture. This is a lovely picture for those of you um, who've not been to Scotland. This is a picture up um, in the Western Isles. So the far, far north and west of Scotland, right on the top left hand corner, um, there's a beautiful um, series of islands that run down the side. And I love this picture because it shows a dog that was actually rescued um, from a not very nice farmer who uh, used to feed it just the sort of bits of dead sheep that that had um from the sheep that had died and things like that so poor um millie she did go on and die of cancer but um she she had a pretty good life once she was rescued and and just got to play um on the beaches and um in the macha which is this wild flower meadows that you get just on the edge of the the seashore up in the western isles so that's just a, a smaller side as we move on to environmental factors so What's the evidence in environmental factors? Well, I touched on earlier the Scottish Terrier and the Scottish Terrier is highly predisposed to transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. And um, there was a study done of a few years back now, just uh, sort of nearly nearly 20 years, not quite yet, um, which showed they were looking specifically at Scottish terriers with bladder tumours and, you know, what predisposed them. So they got a lot of Scotties together and then they asked about dietary um, feeding and, and what, what these animals were eating. And what they found was that consumption of vegetables at least three times per week reduced the incidence of transitional cell carcinoma. And this was particularly so when these animals were being fed kind of green leafy vegetables and yellow orange vegetables. OK, so clearly that was evidence at that point that increasing the amount of vegetable consumption could reduce the risk of this genetically predisposed cancer, you know, so they're already predisposed to it. We don't really understand exactly why the Scottish Terrier is predisposed because we do know that they, if they're exposed to herbicides, that definitely increases the risk. But why the Scottish Terrier? You know, why not anything else? The other thing we have to consider when we're looking at the nutritional impacts is the nutritional impact directly of meat. And I touched on this issue that meat has been shown to be a grade two carcinogen for red meat and a grade one carcinogen for processed meats. And one of the things behind this is the bioaccumulation of toxins. And we know, you know, when we think about the natural environment and predators being being at the top of the tree, if we use poisons, so if we use something to poison a rat or a mouse, and then the predator, one of the predators come and eats that, maybe a, a buzzard comes and eats the dead um, rat, and then the wolf comes and eats the buzzard, all of this causes accumulation of toxins. So the higher up you are on the kind of the tree of predators, if you like, the more accumulation of toxins occurs. And so when we're talking meat, we're talking about something that has eaten potential toxins. So if, if there's something sprayed on the crops like herbicides and then the cow eats the herbicide, we then eat the meat or the dog eats the meat, we're going to get more toxins in our body. And the same really applies for fish. Um, you know, when you start to look at the, the way that fish um, kind of can absorb toxins from the ocean and then things like salmon. So one of the scary things about salmon is that actually they, you know, a lot of salmon has been grown being fed on other fish. So those other fish have already taken in the toxins and the salmon is going to take in more toxins. So whenever we eat meat or we feed meat to our animals, we are increasing that risk of bioaccumulation of toxins. And we probably find that it may actually be worse in the liver tissues. The liver is an organ that is actually responsible for removing toxins from our circulation. Same in all animals. So cow liver, sheep liver, doesn't matter which liver, they are removing as many toxins as they can from their environment. If we then go and eat the liver, we're going to be getting more toxins than necessarily in the meat, but we know it accumulates in the meat as well. So we have to consider the possibility that that meat in itself can be more toxic than, say, eating a, a fresh organic plant that isn't going to have accumulated as many toxins. What about inflammation? Well, we need to avoid inflammation. And to do that, we have to cut out any infections. And we know that, for example, raw meat, which is a, a, 
you know, a really popular um, feeding choice, particularly in the UK. It's It kind of came in probably about 10 years ago and it's become very, very popular. But we know that raw meat does carry a lot of organisms and we're seeing an increased incidence of some of the infectious diseases associated with eating raw meat. And, you know, part of the reason we stopped eating raw meat was for that exact reason. It's much safer to eat cooked meat, you know, so as humans started to cook meat, they got more nutrition from it and they got less infections. So it was a, a bonus. So we know that raw meat carries organisms. It can carry things like Neospora, which is um, a parasite that can affect the brain and cause seizures. It can carry infectious diseases like Salmonella and Campylobacter as well. So there's a lot of things within raw meat itself. So raw meat is a particularly bad idea. Um, obviously, cooking gets rid of some of that risk, but it certainly doesn't get rid of the potential toxins within the meat. Plant-based foods, however, contain phytochemicals that act as antioxidants. So they are basically reversing some of the, the damage to cells. So the cells get damaged and the antioxidants can reverse that damage. And that can help reduce inflammation because inflammation is part of your body's response to normal damaged cells. And carotenoids, which occur in things like, well, in carrots, but also in the kind of coloured vegetables, they're known to have antioxidants effects. So by adding more plant-based feeding into um, any diet, so humans or um, dogs, we can increase the amount of antioxidants that we're exposing them to. We can reduce the amount of toxins that we're exposing them to. It's also really important to note that plant-based feeding can be really helpful in allergic diseases. And this is a relatively new thing here in the UK. It's taken quite a lot of work to really push this, but it can really make a significant difference. Um, I was speaking to a, a friend of mine who has a Bernese mountain dog called Chewy after Chewbacca in Star Wars. And Chewy has had intermittent diarrhea pretty much his whole life. He's like five or six now. And in the last sort of six months, the diarrhea has been getting really a lot worse. And they they contacted me and said, look, I think Chewy might have cancer. We're really worried. What do we do? And I talked them through it all and talking to them about what had been going on. I said, look, I think Chewy could have allergic disease. And let's try a, a pure plant-based diet. And they have flown with this and gone. And they said, Chewy has never had such good guts. His gut health is as good as it's ever been in his entire life just by moving to a fully plant-based diet and it's fantastic to hear because he's had all his scans he's had all his checks there's no sign of cancer so that's a really big positive for him that by reducing that inflammation in his gut we may actually reduce the risk of cancer developing in that location so what's the evidence that we've actually got to back up this, this, you know, these theories that I have, if you like. So I'm presenting information and can I make that that next step to say that plant based diets actually reduce cancer? So really, we're very early days on the studies here. And um a scientist called Andrew Knight, who works out of the UK, has been absolutely a stalwart in looking at this. And those of you who are knowledgeable about vegan diets for pets, I'm sure have read his papers or certainly read transcripts that summarise his papers. And what he's shown is it appears that feeding plant-based diet tends to result in fewer vet visits than meat-based diet. Now, if you make the presumption, which I think is a reasonable presumption that you go to the vet when you have a problem, then that means less problems. That means less inflammation. So that is a good thing. He's also done a study where he's shown that um, dogs fed plant-based diet live around 18 months longer than those fed a meat-based diet. Interestingly, he didn't find a difference in cancer incidence between the two groups, okay? But he did find that all diseases increase with age, and that was across the board, so all inflammatory diseases, all cancer-type diseases. And of course, we have a bit of a problem here in terms of how we separate this out, because if you've got a dog that's going to live 18 months longer, that's 18 months longer to develop a disease, potentially. So, it's going to be interesting. I think there's going to be a lot more work coming out um, over the next wee while as this feeding plant-based food becomes a lot more mainstream. Vets are a lot more open to it than they've ever been before. And we need to keep working towards understanding what 
the benefits really are because so far they're looking really promising and it is very much early days. One of the challenges is like everything, I think um, any of you who are vegans or vegetarians listening tonight, you'll know that maybe a vegan diet from 20 or 30 years ago, there was very poor knowledge about what was needed to make a vegan diet really healthy. And we are probably 20 years behind in the dog market, but we really now are coming forward with understanding what is required to make a vegan diet truly healthy. So we need to look forward. Um, and as I touched on earlier, at the moment, a lot of studies are just looking back all the time. So we need to now look forward and see what happens over the next kind of 15, 20 years to these patients who are perhaps growing up on a, a plant-based diet from a much younger age, rather than the ones that are maybe converting to a plant-based diet um, in middle or old age. So let's look at the criteria and see can and answer that fundamental question of can plant-based feeding stop cancer in dogs? Well, I know from personal experience and experience of others, this is my dog Jumble, he's a, the one with the mast cell tumor on his head. Um, he was very overweight. Um, he was being fed a normal um, high-end brand of complete dog food and he was getting fatter and fatter and fatter. And I'd spoken to a friend of mine um, who is very much big in the plant-based um, dog food world. And she was like, oh, you might want to try this. So I said, okay, let's try it. And I, I personally, from my experience, feeding him plant-based made a big difference to control his weight. He's mostly Labrador with a little hint of Collie. And what I noticed was he was less hungry and his weight was better controlled. So I think that, you know, there is certainly evidence and lots of benefits to cutting that your, your dog's weight and plant-based can really help with that. So if it helps cut your weight, that will hopefully help reduce that aspect of the incidence of cancer. We know it will help reduce inflammation and allergic disease in the bowel and in the skin. Again, a lot of dogs with itchy skin will really respond well to plant-based. We've spent many years as vets kind of recommending lots of different protein sources and chopping and changing and all of this. And it's very difficult if you've got a scratchy dog, but plant-based seems to be one of the best ones for changing over to if you've got a dog with allergic skin disease. And so we can help reduce the inflammation in the skin. We can help reduce the inflammation in the bowel. And that's very, very helpful. Cutting out the meat is going to avoid a significant number of carcinogens. So carcinogens are things that cause cancer and also the toxins. OK, and I think it's it's slightly different in the UK and in the US. Um, you may or may not have been following the, the issues that um, we have in our trade deals with the US where um, there's talk of bringing in chicken and beef. And there's a lot of resistance in the UK to stuff coming in from America because there's a lot more free um, use of things that we would class as toxins here in, in Europe, where you guys have used it to enhance the growth of the, the, the animals that are being used for meat. So that may be even more pressing in certain countries where you do allow the use of growth promotants um, and growth hormones and things like that, or things like poorer welfare resulting in um, more illness within the, the animals that is then covered up with other treatments. So yeah, I think there may be more risk in some parts of the world as well um, than others. We know that plant-based food contains a lot more antioxidants. So that's a good thing because that's going to help convert these cells to, to more normal healthy cells, get rid of cells earlier. So these mutated cells are not going to be more happening as often because we're getting rid of the damaged cell, the cells that damage the, uh, the cells and make them convert into something nastier. And we know that a plant-based diet can help dogs live longer and stay generally more healthy. And we have published evidence to support that. So therefore, yes, plant-based feeding could stop cancer in dogs. But we have to remember that if we let them live longer, so if we have a dog that instead of living to 10, lives to 12, it is exposed to the other factors in our environment. So it's exposed to passive smoking, pollution, um, radiation. So it's not going to get rid of all cancers, but I would far rather be living in a situation where my cancers, these cancers are coming in much later in these dogs' lives. And I hope in the future, we will start to see that. And I certainly believe that plant-based feeding can help achieve that. 
And this is my final picture before I move on to take your questions. And this is a picture um, of a place I go to every summer up in Perthshire. Um, it's a little bit further north from where I am in Scotland. And it's a, an old ruined house that I have been visiting since I was a child. And I feel like this picture summarises um, the journey that we go on with our pets. You know, we are going to a point where we know there is going to be a crumbly ruin at the end of the day. Um, no matter what we do, we're all going to end up a crumbly ruin at the end of the day. But it's important that the journey to get to the crumbly ruin is as nice and as pleasant as it can be. And for me, um, this is a, a picture I use very commonly in all my talks because I feel it's the, the journey that I want my patients to make, the ones that have already got cancer, but equally the ones that haven't yet got cancer. Let's make that journey as long as it can be and as pleasurable as it can be and keep them as healthy and as happy and active as they can possibly be. So thank you all for listening and I'm very, very happy now to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Nottenbelt. That was amazing information. I know everybody just learned an absolute ton and I'll be honest, we actually don't have a ton of questions and I think it's because the content was extremely straightforward and it was really just an opportunity for people to really learn about this really interesting topic. Um, but we do have a few questions. Um, so what kind of vegetables can we feed our pets? Okay, so basically most vegetables you can feed your pets, but I think the important thing is, are you feeding it on its, if you're trying to create a home cooked diet, so if you want to feed, there are some vegetables you probably shouldn't feed huge amounts of, so um, you shouldn't be feeding too much kind of what they call the cruciferous ones, so broccoli um, and cabbage, but things like your carrots, your potatoes, and some, you know, some cabbage is fine, but just not tons and tons of it so keep a quite balanced diet but um peppers there's all sorts of really good plant-based type products so when we think of vegetables we think of the kind of things we boil on a stove um but we need to think about things like um lupine and um soya which a lot of diets don't contain much soya all our grains if we want to some people want grain free some people don't um you know so we can go with pretty much anything but no, everything in moderation the key is i think with um animal nutrition is to make sure it's balanced and it is possible to get a really good balanced home cooked diet but you need to get the right people advising you i don't know if that's something is that something wild earth are involved in at all jeff uh no so i mean really our you know goal is to provide the nutritionally complete and balanced dog food so that people yeah. don't have to take the time to formulate their own yeah food. i mean you know i've certainly worked with a vet who's worked very hard to formulate it it's not easy to get it absolutely right but there's lots of things you can feed lentils and you know lots and lots of things but certainly the work that I've done with her, you do require supplements when you do that. So if you're feeding a, an exclusively plant-based diet um, that you're trying to formulate yourself, it's really important you get advice on the recipes. So it's not straightforward. I personally tend to feed, I feed my dog, you know, his plant-based complete product um, because I know that I can count on that to be balanced. But it's he's he loves lots of bits of vegetables and that's the weird thing is since I started feeding him a plant-based kibble he likes more vegetables he used to pick out the vegetables and the funniest one for him was couscous because he always works around the couscous and leaves the little couscous grains he doesn't like the couscous so it's it's a little bit of yes you can add carrots in carrots are often in liver diets um quite commonly they're, they're used you know if you've got a dog on a prescription diet you'll often see a lot of carrot in the liver diets interestingly interesting um somebody actually asked they have a 14 week old puppy and then when can they transition to a plant-based diet so um, most of the plant-based diets are not suitable for puppies. Um, there is, a, there are a couple of diets that are out there that have perhaps got enough, but generally I would wait personally, unless you've got a good veterinary nutritionist on your side, I would wait until they're skeletally mature. So that will depend on the breed of puppy that you've got. So the small breeds will be probably mature at around six to nine months age, whereas the um, the really giant breeds are probably going to be nearer 18 months of age. Um, that's something that 
will also factor in when your dogs like to get neutered. So if you are neutering your pet, then the vet will usually advise that, you know, they'll need to be skeletally mature. So that will help you guide you for that particular size of pet. But broadly, it's going to be somewhere between six months and 18 months, depending on the type and the breed of the animal. Absolutely. Thank you. Actually, next question. Um, how can we get in touch with you? And do you do consultations? Yes, I do do consultations. Um, so you can get in touch with me um, either by emailing. Um, I think I, I've got that at the end of the presentation, which I've now stopped sharing. Um, but um, it's it's at the end of the presentation. You can email me um, information on that. The way I work um, is that I'm a referral clinician, so I do need permission from your own vet to do a consultation with you. But in exchange, I then write to them and provide advice and support. If you're looking for nutritional consultations, then I can also recommend someone in the UK who can specifically look at your dog's diet and, and check that you are doing everything that you need to do right to transition across to plant-based, um, who's very good. So that that isn't my area of specialism, transitioning across, because although I have a lot of interest in plant-based, I'm not a plant-based nutritionist. I'm a pro plant-based oncologist, if that makes sense. That makes tons of sense. I just put your email address into the chat. So if anybody would like Perfect. to get in contact with Dr. Nottenbelt, um, the email address is in the chat for you. You can also find her on Facebook as well. And that would be at Hawk and Dove Vets. And I also That's put that great. in the chat as well. Um, and then the last question that I see right now actually just basically says, what about cats? Okay, so cats is a little bit harder, um, but there is a lot of work looking at what we can do with cats. So um, Andrew Knight has done a study looking at cats and it has shown that cats can be healthy on a plant based diet, which is really exciting news because it has been a, a much slower journey with cats. Cats get cancer um, and pretty much with the same frequency as dogs, maybe very slightly less. But that's probably because a lot of cats die for other reasons, like being hit by cars and things like that. It's not because there's less cancer out there. They just don't get alive that long because there's something else happens um, when they're out and about on the street. Um, but we know that the same criteria apply to cats with cancer in terms of the risks of cancer would be similar for them. Um, the types of things that can cause it. So in theory, plant-based diets could do that. It is early days with plant-based diets for cats. Um, there's There's been a lot of interest, um, both from a climate change perspective. And so people have been doing a lot of insect work with cats. So looking at, at identifying insect-based diets that are more environmentally sound than feeding a lot of fish to your cat. Um, but it's still early days and there's not very many commercial cat diets out there. And because cats we call them obligate carnivores. They're, they're actually been proven that they're not obligate carnivores by Andrew Knight's work. Um, but it's very important that they get enough um, taurine, which is an amino acid commonly found in meat. Now, there is possible to supplement that taurine through plant, you know, clever use of plant based products. Um, but it's important that that does happen because if they don't have enough taurine, they get heart disease. And obviously, that's not good. Well, that is all we have today for questions. Thank you so much. I want to thank our audience. I know that we said this is going to be about 15 minutes. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed all of the incredible information that Dr. Nottenbelt shared. Um, again, check the chat for her email address if you're interested to learn more. Um, we will have more content for you coming down the pipeline in September. So stay tuned. And I just want to thank everybody and thank Dr. Nottenbelt again and hope everyone has a lovely rest of your day.